Everybody glad to be at church, to be at church tonight? Uh, amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and get started this evening. We've got much to be in prayer for this evening. Remember Miss Nancy Linscombe's uh, family. Her uncle passed away this morning. Is that correct? This afternoon. Uh, so remember him in prayer. Uh, how's it, Elka? Good. Okay. All right, good. So keep her in your prayers. Uh, remember Apple Campbell in prayers tonight. Remember uh, Tom in our prayers uh, for tomorrow. Um, he's having a, a, a surgery tomorrow, so remember him. Anything else this evening? If not, I'll ask Brother Mike Riddle to open us up in prayer. Amen. Well, I'll stand this evening. I'll get Miss Joanna to come and play uh, for us tonight. We sing our, <clears throat> we're going to sing our uh, chorus, our, not chorus, our song tonight, There Shall Be Showers of Blessings. You're welcome. Sorry, I should have told you that. My bad. I own that one. <laughs> I know what Marissa would tell me about my communication on that if that was her. <laughs> shall be showers of blessings this is the promise of love there shall be seasons refreshing sent from the savior above showers of blessings showers of blessings we Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again, over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of Showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessings. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling but for the showers we plead there shall be showers of blessings oh that today they might fall now as to God we're confessing now as on Jesus we call Showers of blessings, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the 
showers we plead. Thank you for standing. You can be seated tonight. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Revelation chapter number two tonight. Revelation chapter number two tonight. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number two. And uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last Wednesday night. And um, you will definitely need our Bibles tonight for Revelation chapter number 2 and Revelation chapter number 3. Actually, I think we need to go to Revelation chapter number 3. It's exactly where we need to go. <laughs> Revelation chapter number 3, because we left, we picked up, we left off in chapter number 3. Uh, last Wednesday night, we did the, ch the churches viewed practically is where we left off last Wednesday night. We dealt with Smyrna being the fearful church. They was fearful because of persecution. We dealt with Pergamos being the faltering church because of their pagan worship. We dealt with Thyatira being the false church and Sardis being the fruitless church. He said, I know thy works and thy works are what? Dead. And that was not a good judgment there. And tonight I want us to pick up in the church of Philadelphia tonight. Now be Revelation chapter number three and verse number seven. When you find your place there, say amen. And we're on the churches viewed practically. Verse number seven, and the angel of the Lord, excuse me, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that at the key of David, he that openeth, uh, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. And when you want to go back to that, you say, how do you, how do you know that? Well, when you go back, Jesus shut, or God shut the door on the ark, and no man could what? Open it, right? And it was a door that only God could close. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, to do li uh, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. And that word temptation there is the hour of trouble, the hour of the storm. Uh, moving on. Uh, from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world and to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, and no man shall take thy, I mean, and no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. When we get here tonight, we see the fruitless church, but the Bible here about the church of Philadelphia, if you had to write an F word for them, it would be the feeble church. The Bible says in verse number, <clears throat> excuse me, verse number 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength. And when we think about that tonight, I think about Philadelphia being a feeble church. We know that the, the, we know that the king of Pergamos intended for Philadelphia to become a center of Greece, Greece aesthetic civilization which means a spreading of the Greek languages and customs in the eastern part of Lydia and Ferga. It was a missionary city founded to promote the unity of spirit, customs, and loyalty within the realm. When we think about this tonight, the Church of Philadelphia was a missionary-minded church dedicated to spread the gospel. There used to be an old hymn that we used to sing called Little as Much When God is in it. Y'all remember that song? And when we think about that tonight, the church here was known as a feeble church because they had little strength. But because they had little strength, the Bible says that they kept the word of God. The Lord said that if you have a red letter Bible, they have kept my name and they have not or kept my word and they have not denied my name. Even though that there were times that it would have been easy for them to say, hey, I'm not going to keep the word of God anymore. 
They said, no, we're going to hold true to the word of God. Even though that it would have been easy to deny the name of God, they said, no, I'm going to hold true to that name that is a name above all names. And the Bible talks about the Lord's name being a name above all names. He said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that what? Jesus Christ is Lord. And it doesn't matter how weak we seem, that is not an excuse for us not to serve God with our fullest potential. But you don't know what I've done. Well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. Well, you don't know what I've said. And I've said a lot. No, I'm kidding. You don't know where I've been. That does, that's not excuses on why you should not be able to serve God. I love, I love people, Moses made an excuse. Moses said, Lord, I cannot serve you because I cannot speak. And God gave him Aaron and Moses never learned to shut up. Man, was that what? Never mind, I'm not saying it. Moving on. But anyway, Moses tonight used to, had a weakness. God gave him Aaron to help him overcome that weakness. Tonight, if you will take the little strength that you have, and ask God for, your, for help with it, it will become a strength like you've never known. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which what? Strengtheneth me. When we look tonight at ourselves, the Bible says here that they were weak. Is that right? Of little strength. But a little strength is all they needed to keep fighting for the things of God. Moving on tonight, not only do we see the feeble church. Everybody good on the church of Philadelphia? If we are, say amen. All right, go with me tonight <clears throat> to, ver to verse number 14. The Bible says in verse number 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write these things, that, um, write these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot. I would work that cold or hot. So then thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Can I, can I, can I, compliment, can I comment on something right here? Verse number 16. He said, so then thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot. Have you ever went somewhere and ordered a cup of coffee, and it wasn't cold, and it wasn't hot, and it was disgusting? Am I right? Coffee is not made to be frozen and drink cold. All right? Coffee's made to be drinking hot. Some will disagree with me on that. There's nothing nastier than a cold coffee. I had, I had a large cup of coffee this morning. I drank half of it on my way to work. I set it down. I worked. And I went back and I turned up that cup of coffee and it was cold. It was room temperature. Oh, it was terrible. I felt like the Lord felt about the church of Laodicea. I spit it out of my mouth real quick. Moving on. Behold, thou sayest, I am rich and have increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. And I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Tonight, when I look at the church of Laodicea, and if we get into the church of Laodicea, we, and if you get into the ages of the church and what each church age represents, and we're going to get into that, we would currently say that the, the church today, we are in the Laodicean church today. I wouldn't say that there's a church out there that's super hot, and I would say there's not a lot of churches out there that's super cold, but there's a lot of churches that are in the middle of the road that are neither one. Are y'all with me? And, when that, and I ain't talking about whether it's the hottest church because of the most people they have or the coldest church because they have the least amount of people. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. They, we've got a lot of churches that are right in the middle of the road. They've not grown cold and indifferent on God, but they're not on fire for God like they should be. They're right in the middle, and when they're right in the middle, God says, I'm not happy with that. 
And when we think about that tonight, the Laodicean church would be known, if you're writing all the F words down for these churches, they would be known as the fashionable church. How do you get that? Verse number 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing. They said, we've got all the money in the bank that we need. We've got all the nice... Well, they didn't have cars in these days. We'll put it in today's age, okay? We've got all the nice cars in there. We've got doctors. We've got lawyers. We've got teachers. We've got politicians that come to our church. We don't need anything. But yes, you do. You need one thing. What do you need? The Spirit of God inside of the church. When you study about the Laodicean... This, this town was renowned, was known for its prosperity. This city recovered itself from disaster without seeking imperial aid. The city was so wealthy that it was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 62 in the days of Nero. It declined the offer of help from imperial government, boasting that they had need of nothing. Laodicean was known for its bankers. In Rome, they had a rep reputation of never adulterating the gold they issued to their clients. Laodicea was noted to for its raven-colored wool. It boasted of its medical school and was renowned for the manufacture of special ointment. Everything that God called out here is why they said we have need of nothing. They were spiritually blinded. They said our church isn't struggling financially. Our church isn't struggling with material goods. We've got the biggest crowd. We've got the richest crowd. We've got all of that. And God said, yeah, but there's one thing that you don't have. My presence in your church. You talk about me. You sing about me. You pray to me. But you're right in the middle of hot and cold. You're lukewarm. Jesus said, I counsel thee. In other words, I want to take and I want to give you some advice. When we go to a counselor, we go to the counselor for what? Advice, right? When, when now some people listen to it, some people don't listen to it. And that's up to you. But these people were boasting about everything. And the Lord said, listen, I want to counsel you. I want you to go and I want you to buy the gold that's been tried in the fire. Now, preacher, what's so important about gold being tried in the fire? Gold that has been tried in the fire is the purest gold that you can buy. Am I right? It may not be the prettiest at the time, because when it's tried in the fire, the impurities come out, any defects come out, right? But at the end of it, at the end of the day, it's pure. He said that thou mayest be rich. He said, I want you to get clothed in the white raiment that thou mayest be ashamed of thy nakedness. When I think about that tonight, there are people out here that are spiritually naked. When you think about that, you say, Preacher, what do you mean about that? The Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to withstand the what? Wiles of the devil. But there are people tonight who have refused to put on the armor that would protect them from the wiles of the devil. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. When we think about that tonight, that we don't need to be, if I told you we was going to war tonight, all right? And I said, I've got a stack of bulletproof vests, I've got helmets, I've got everything that you need to go to war. I've got shields up here that are bulletproof, you can get behind it and you can live. What would you do? Would you walk out there without any of that and risk it? Or would you come up here and get suited up and then go out? I think all of us would suit up and go out, right? Spiritually speaking tonight, there's a lot of us who says, God, I don't need that armor that you tell me to wear. I can handle this myself. And when you do that, you're boasting spiritually and the Lord says, you're naked. This was, a, this was one of my favorite parts of this. He said, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Tonight, when I think about that, the church of Laodicea was fashionable. They were naked. They were blind. They could not see their faults and their failures. They said, we've got everything 
that we need? And the Lord says, no, you need me. Tonight, may we not ever get to a place that we are spiritually blinded that keeps us from seeing who we are, where we are, and what we are. The psalmist wrote, search me, O God, and know my heart. Am I right? Tonight, there's a lot of us need to take the ISAV of the Word of God, and we need to say, God, help me to see me how you see me. God, I want to see my faults. I want to see my failures. God, I want to see anything and everything that is wrong with me the way that you see it. Lord, I don't want a stone left unturned. It's easy for me to go out and point fingers and say, you're doing this, you're doing that, you're doing this, you're doing that. When I should be standing in the presence of you saying, God, show me what I am doing wrong that I may not be blinded. James talks about looking into a looking glass. You know what a looking glass is? A mirror. And when you think about looking into a mirror, what do you see in the mirror? You can think you're the most beautiful person in the world. And then you look in the mirror and you're like, who? Who is that person? <laughs> Am I right? You, you think you're a good looking person until you wake up at 5.30 in the morning running off three hours of sleep and you look in the mirror and you say, who is that old person in the mirror? Oh, that's me. We think about that tonight. Help us, Lord, never to be a fashionable church. But God, help me to see me for who I am. You know, we should pray that prayer not only as an individual tonight, but we should pray that prayer as a church tonight. God, help us see Community Baptist Church for how you see Community Baptist Church. God, help me to see... You know, it's easy for us to sit back and criticize other churches for what they're doing and how they're doing things because we think we're so right sometimes. But Lord, help me to see the church the way that you see it. Show me your will, your direction, your way for the church. Are y'all with me tonight? God, help us not to become a Laodicean church. We, even though we're in the Laodicean church age, that does not mean that we have to be a Laodicean church. Does that make sense tonight? Just because the rest of the world is lukewarm does not mean we have to be content with being lukewarm. So lastly tonight, I want us to go back to Revelation chapter number 2 tonight. Revelation chapter number 2. And we're going to come back to this next week as well. In verse number 1. We get to the church of Ephesus. The church of Ephesus, if you're writing the F words for it, will be known as the formal church. Preacher, how do you get that? The Bible says in verse number one, and to the church and to the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things. He that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how, that's can, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 3, and hast borne them, and hast borne, and hast patience, for my, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. When I see this tonight, I see the formal church. It starts off that this church was in the presence of the Lord. Because he said, These things saith he that holdeth seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Who's that he? The Lord, right? It's what John said. Moving on. Not only do we see them as the formal church, because they stand in the presence of the Lord. Not only because they stood in the presence of the Lord did it make them a, form, a formal church, it made them a strong church. He said here in verse number 3, And has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake, has labored, and has not, what? Fainted. But now get a hold of this. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. They had a fault. What is it? 
Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy what? First love. You know, that would be a hard place to be as a church. What if Jesus walked into Community Baptist Church tonight and says, You know what? You're not a lukewarm church. You're a hot church. Everything's going good for you. But I have somewhat of a problem. What is it, Lord? And he listed out the problem. Could you imagine if Jesus was to walk into the church age today and all of us come in with a big smile on our face and he walked down the middle of the aisle and he says, you know, I like this about this church, I like that about this church, but you got a problem. You've left your first love. That should be one of our prayers tonight as a Christian is that we do not leave our first love. Who is our first love as a Christian tonight? It's Christ, right? He said we love him because why? He first loved us. Moving on, is everybody good with the church's view practically? For good, say amen. All right, let's move to the second part of this. The church's view perennially. When we think of this word tonight, this word perennially there means in a way that continues for a long time. Or an infinite time, permanently. We think about that tonight. We think about, some of y'all laugh at me when I say lastly, and I go on for 20 more minutes after I say lastly, and I say lastly like 20 times. Yeah, that's a perennially message, okay? It's a long message. It's going to be an infinite message. No, I'm moving on. But no, we get into the churches tonight. And there's different things tonight, and I'm going to run through these quickly because we've already touched on some of these things, that when we look at the different churches tonight, how we see them perennially. The conditions of the, in the existing seven churches of Asia Minor that were selected by the Lord to receive these letters are conditions that have always existed in local churches. These letters are relevant, notice this, in all ages of the churches that sojourn, sojourn on earth. When we look at all of the churches that are mentioned here, all seven churches, somewhere we will be able to find something in each church that still takes place today. Does that make sense? All right, moving on. He said there have always been churches needing the message addressed to Ephesus, for example. There have always been churches facing persecution, as in Smyrna, and in the inroads of worldliness, as at Pergamos. False doctrine as at Thyatira, tradition or lukewarmness as at Laodicea. So tonight when we look at these different churches and the perennial problems that they faced, these are the same problems that we face today. We would have, let's, let's go back, the church of Ephesus, they left their first love, right? That would be, that would be a, um, what's the, a, What's the right word here? That would be a cold and indifferent church, but they've left their first love, which means they love something else. So that would be an adultering church, right? Is that, is that the right word? So when we look at that tonight, they was a church that was in adultery. Then we look at the church of Smyrna tonight. They were a church of persecution, so when you think about that, we go from an adultering church to a church of persecution. And we, I'm going to get into this in just a second. And then we get into the worldly church. A church that has no desire for God. It's all about self and how I feel when I leave church. Do I feel good? Do I feel happy? Did somebody give up and give a lovely speech tonight? That's not the way we should come to church. We should come to church and say, did we hear from God? So tonight, when we look at these churches, each one of these churches tonight represents something. Ephesus tonight, the church of Ephesus, sets before us the issue of fundamentalism. The picture of a church that is busy outwardly, a church that is sound, but lacking in love. What's our theme for this year at the church? Or as thyself, right? So what if we was a busy church, and we are somewhat of a busy church. We have a food pantry, right? We have trail life on Wednesday nights, right? 
And we have Bible study on Wednesday nights. We have Sunday school on Sunday mornings. We have church dinners the third Saturday of every month. We've got all of these things that are outwardly, they are what? They look good, right? You come in and you talk to us about doctrine, and we have all of our doctrine right. Well, we should. All right? Our doctrine is not man-based, but our doctrine is what? Bible-based, right? So we would be known as a fundamentalist, and I despise that word to some extent, a fundamentalist church. But what if we had all of that right and we didn't show love to our neighbors? What if we had all of that right and we had zero love for Christ? To have all of that other stuff right, but to be lacking in love, would be an ultimate fail as a church. Am I right about that? When I think about that tonight, we have a lot of so-called... i got to be careful. I'm going to get myself in a hole. I'll get out of it, though. We have a lot of so-called fundamental Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, all of that, that think that all of their doctrine is right, and they think their doctrine is what's going to get them to heaven. And at the end of the day, they do not love the Lord. And they do not love their neighbor. And the Bible t teaches us plainly, and I dealt with it Sunday, that it is impossible to love God and not to love fellow man. And it is impossible tonight not to love fellow man and not to love God. The Bible says, and they will know that we are Christians because why? We love one another. Tonight, let's not be the church of Ephesus to where we are so fundamental that we say our doctrine's right. Our, our doctrine is right. Our church is busy. We do all of these things right. And then we forget to show love. This week I was in a conversation. And if you follow me on social media, you've seen I was involved in a conversation this week about churches and what churches are doing and what preachers are running down other preachers and all of that. And this gentleman made this statement. He said, I will stick with the old stuff because that's what saved me. And me and Daniel was sitting at lunch and we was looking at it. And we started laughing and I said, I'm not going there. I'm going to let, let it go. Another preacher friend of mine jumped in and said, no, it's not. And when I got to thinking about that, I said, and I was studying this last night and this afternoon. And I was sitting there and I was like, you're fundamentally sound, but have zero love for fellow man. Tonight, God help us not to be the church of Ephesus. Moving on. Everybody good with church of Ephesus? All right. Moving on. In Smyrna, the church of Smyrna, their perennial problem was to be faced with ritual, ritualism. When we get to look at the church of Smyrna, it's mentioned is made of the synagogue of Satan and the deliberate Judaizing of Christianity. We know that Judaism ended where? Anybody want to tell me? Calvary, right? Because during the days of the Jews, they said that in order for you to be saved, and we dealt with this in the book of Romans, in order for you to be a Christian, you had to be circumcised. And Paul said, no, you don't. You have to have your heart fixed. It's not a physical attribute, but it is a spiritual attribute. The days of Judaism is over. They ended at Calvary when God rent the veil in the temple, and he tore it. Notice that. To attempt to clothe, then, uh, to attempt to uh, to clothe the church in tattered remnants of dead religion is condemned throughout the entire New Testament. Paul went through different churches that faced Judaism, legalism, and said, listen, you've got to put a stop to this. What you are saying and what you are doing is wrong. 
You know that still runs rampant today in our church age that we're living in? If you do this, then you're not saved. If you do that, then you're not saved. The last time that I looked in my Bible, in order for a man to be saved, he must repent of his sin and ask Jesus Christ into his heart and believe that God hath raised him from the dead and thou shalt be what? Saved. So tonight, and be, that does not give you a license to sin, do not get me wrong, but there are those out there still today that are in ritual, ritualism that says, if you go to this place, you're not saved. That's not true. If you go and do this, you're not saved. If you say this, you're not saved. Our people say, and I'm not condoning it, and I'm not I'm not saying that it's right, but I've heard preachers say in the past, well, if you cuss, then you're not saved because the Holy Spirit does not dwell inside of you. Okay? You want to go there? Yeah. You want to have that discussion? Yeah. I will have that discussion. Why? The Bible says Peter cursed. So when Peter cursed, does that mean that Peter wasn't saved? Are y'all with me? Am I right about that? Am I wrong about that? When you think about it, there are different things throughout the Word of God. I've heard people say, well, if you're drunk, you can't be saved. Really? Lot got drunk? And what does the Bible say in the book of 1 Peter, 2 Peter, about Lot? Lot was a what? Just man, right? He was a saved man. Now, I'm not giving you a license to go out and cuss everybody out, and I'm not giving you a license to go get drunk. But what I am telling you tonight is this, is that even though that you sin... That does not mean that you are not saved. Those same people tonight that will say that are the same people that when they get behind closed doors, they're a whole different person than they are out in public. Jesus had a word for those people. Those people are known as Pharisees. Are y'all with me? They don't want to change nothing. They want to continue in their same ruts, their same routines. And it was wrong. And this church of Smyrna wanted to go through the rituals. We've always done it this way. We're always going to do it this way. We've always said it that way. But just because we've always done it that way, always because we've said it that way, does not mean that that way is always right. Y'all with me? Tonight, when I think about that, I think about the traditions, and I'm almost done, the traditions of our local churches tonight. We need to look at those and say, are they Bible-based or are they man-based? We have a lot of man-based religion in our churches tonight. I, w I have openly said many times that Community Baptist Church is probably one of the most Bible-based churches that I've been a part of. There was one other one. And when I think about that tonight, it's because we understand that man's doctrine will kill a church, but the Bible doctrine will allow the church to thrive. And not everyone will agree when you stay with the Bible and you won't get off on the bandwagons and you won't get off on the trails chasing everybody down and saying things that are not, that, saying things that are not true, saying things that are ridiculous, saying things that are far-fetched, and there's no Bible to back it up. Moving on. The Church of Pergamos. Everybody good on the Church of Ephesus, right? All right. Everybody's good on the Church of Smyrna, right? All right. The Church of of Pergamos. The church of Pergamos is clericalism. They set up a separate case of the church to those who officiate in matters religiously. This seems to be the root of or Nicolaitanism, that which is the deed, that which was called a deed in the letter to Ephesus and accepted doctrine. At Pergamos. So what we would say here is that the church of Pergamos wrote the laws, if I understand this correctly and if I've studied this correctly, the church of Pergamos wrote the laws 
and sent them down to other churches and say, this is the way that your church should operate. Does that, under, does that make sense? They had like the case of the, and I'll give you an example of that, the Sadducees. What was the job of the Sadducees? To study the law, right? Am I right about that, Mike? I'm on track on that? All right. The Sadducees studied the law. Paul, the apostle Paul, in his younger days, would have been known as a Sadducee. He knew the law inside and out. But just because they knew the law didn't mean that they fully understood the law and did not mean that they had the ability to write down to the other churches and say, this is the way that you need to run your church. There are people today that if you say you are part of clericalism, they would laugh at you, but let your church do something different than their church, and they will disown you because your church isn't following their same rules and guidelines. That's not the way that God intended for the church to run. The church should run based off of the Bible, not based off of man's rules and man's opinions. Am I right about that? Moving on tonight. The church of Thyatira. We're going to quit right here, all right? The church of Thyatira. They confront the issue of idolatry. Jezebel points us back to the Old Testament who officially introduced the abomination of Baal worship with its other idolatries, cruelties, and priestcraft into Ahab's kingdom. The prophets of Baal failed when God's people stood. Jezebel had a man killed because he wouldn't give up his vineyard by the name of Naboth. She took the signet of the king's ring, stamped it, and said, he's dead. We get over into the New Testament. We find a lady that is dancing before the king. John the Baptist said something about it. And what happened to John the Baptist? Dead. Done. Tonight, we must be careful. And I'm going to deal with this just a little bit, okay? That we do not get wrapped up in the idolatries of the church age that we live in. Say, preacher, prove it, and I will. In the Bible days, you had the bell worship. You had the worship of where you passed, what was the name of that God? You would pass the young in through the fire and it would kill them. Help me out. Molech. Molech, yes. You had the sun goddesses, you had the moon goddesses throughout. Today, we have idolism and idols in the church. Prove it. I will. Y'all ready? You ain't going to get me in trouble, am I? The idolism of having Baptist on our name in our churches. I had a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago, and they made this statement to me. They said, only Baptists are going to heaven. I laughed. I said, show me in this Bible where it says that. I said, I will have that conversation with you. I will have great debate with that conversation with you. I said, we will go toe-to-toe -to -toe in this conversation. And we did. It got heated. You say, did you argue? No, I didn't argue. I used the Bible. I said, Jesus didn't come to say, Jesus didn't say, I come to seek and save those which are Baptist. Am I right? He said, I come to seek and to save those which are what? Lost. Somebody asked me the other day, oh, we was at a place the other night, I was at a place the other night, and I was sitting down talking to a, to a group of guys, and we was talking about church, and I had some Catholics there, I had a church of God there, and I, I was the only Baptist there. And I was, I, we was poking fun, I was poking fun at the Catholics. I shouldn't have been, but they started it. They picked on us Baptists, so I fired back, okay? I held my own. I defended our faith, but no, I'm not making fun of Catholics. But it was all in fun. But anyway, they poked fun at the Baptists, then I poke, and then the Church of God jumped in there and said, you know what I like about Baptists? I said, what's that? He said, y'all can do anything and not go to hell. And I started laughing. I said, that's because we can't lose our salvation. I said, you serve a weak God. But you know, and that was a joke about all of that. But when I think about that tonight, I think about in our church age that we're in now, 
that we have made an idol out of the name Baptist. If I took, and I'm, I'm not, so don't get upset when I say this, but if, if somebody rode by the church one day and Baptist was removed from this sign, our church would be known as a liberal church because we're not Baptist. Are y'all with me? If you tell someone my church is a part of the Southern Baptist Association, you automatically, and we was a part of it for a long time, many, many years, you would be known as a liberal church. So they worship not only the Baptist name, but they also worship, and I'm not throwing, I'm not throwing rocks. I know some's going to watch this and some's going to stone me for this, but that's okay. They worship putting independent, fundamental, premillennial Baptist church on their signs. They worship that they're independent, they worship that they're fundamental, and they worship that they're premillennial. premillennial. But they have no love. I'll go a step further. They've made, a, they've made idols out of that. They've made idols out of the King James Bible. You talk to them. What Bible do you use? I use the 1611 King James Bible. No, you don't. Say, so prove it. I will. Our Bibles is the 1783 or 17... i got to find it right here. It's right here in front of my Bible somewhere. 1783 or 1785 edition of the King James Bible. If you had a 1611 King James Bible tonight, I would guarantee you this. None of us would be in here reading it. Because your I's and your U's and your E's and your A's and all of that's all messed up. All of your verses is in Roman numerals. After you get past 12, I am lost. Okay? I am lost. But no, when we think about that tonight, we must not make an idol. And I appreciate the King James Bible. Don't get me wrong. I appreciate being a Baptist. I understand why I'm a Baptist. If I had to discuss why I'm a Baptist tonight, it's not because I was raised that way, but it is. it was the church that was closest to the beliefs of Christ. Okay? That's why we are a Baptist. We do not believe in infant baptism because infant baptism does nothing. Say, preacher, prove it. I will. David. I told you I was finishing, didn't I? David had a child out of wedlock. David's child died. God made a promise to David that David would see that child again. So it does not need to be baptized in order to go into heaven. Jesus only baptized as a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection. A person does not have to be baptized in order to go to heaven. There are several different reasons people aren't baptized today. Some aren't physically able to be baptized. Some, are, some are, have a fear of water that they couldn't be baptized. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized. He still went to heaven. But we believe in baptism by submersion. We believe in the Lord's Supper, right? We believe that's an ordinance of the local church. We believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And there's many more things that I go through there. But we do not need to idolize being a Baptist. We do not need to idolize the King James Bible. We do not need to idolize doctrines, but we need to keep our focus on God and the things of God. So I'm going to stop right there tonight. Everybody good? All right. If they make sense tonight, did I lose us tonight? Any questions on anything I said tonight? All right. We good? All right. All right, we'll dismiss in a word of prayer. I'm going to ask Nancy Linscombe to close us out in prayer today.